Welcome to Between the Stacks, After Hours, a podcast made possible by Athens Limestone County Public Library. Each episode brings you a conversation, a cocktail, and some contemplation about a notable author and their work. So grab your favorite beverage and let's go Between the Stacks, After Hours. So we are on our very first episode of Between the Stacks. After hours. Clink. <laughs> so in this podcast, uh, Anna Clem and I, Jennifer Baxter, we choose either a book or a series of books or an author, and we kind of do a deep dive into that author as we pay homage to said author by drinking an interesting cocktail at the same time. Yes. Yes. So cocktails and books. Cocktails and books. Woohoo! Mm-hmm. Two of our favorite things. And this month... We have decided to read the short stories of Shirley Jackson. Yes. So Shirley Jackson, interesting pick. She has a series of short stories of which the most famous is The Lottery. And apparently, literally everyone read that in the eighth grade. I definitely did. I did not. Oh, well, that makes one of us (laughs) out of two. Very good odds. So, and she also wrote We Have Always Lived in the Castle, which I started reading and realized, hey, I saw this on Netflix. Nice. Yeah. And she also wrote The Haunting of Hill House. Yes. Which I started reading and quit because I don't do scary stuff. (laughs) Okay. And so in honor of Miss Shirley Jackson, which this might make a lot more sense as we get into our convo, but Mm -hmm. we have chosen the drink. The Dirty Shirley. (laughs) The Dirty Shirley. Yes. So... You go. What did you... You read the short story. Yes. So let me preface this by saying that... I have never read anything of Shirley Jackson's before, and um, when we picked this author and this book, The Lottery, I was told that it was a collection of short stories. So uh, I come to the library to pick up the book, and it's definitely not, doesn't look like a short story. (laughs) Um, So I begin reading the book, and I'm confused why the characters in each chapter are not, they're not related. (laughs) There's no relation to each chapter. (laughs) <laughs> There's new characters in every chapter. I'm so confused. So I finally Google the lottery to find out what she's talking about and why <laughs> there doesn't seem to be any repetition of characters and realize that the lottery is actually the last short story of the entire book. So <laughs> I've got halfway through, skip to the end, and there we go. Great. So if we're asking if I read the lottery, I read the lottery. And what did you think? Well, um, it was interesting. It was darker than I expected. Hmm. Um, but give it, us a little, give the audience a tiny bit of a recap without giving away the whole story, because as you may or may not know, this book is available for checkout at your local public library. Yes, unless I turn it in tomorrow. <laughs> so, um, it starts, she, she paints a very beautiful picture of a, of a, of a town, correct? Mm-hmm. Mm. Side note, I haven't read this since I was 13. That was oh. your job. You were the one that read <laughs> the lottery. <laughs> well. This could be interesting. So she paints a picture of a very picturesque town. It seems very calm, and it doesn't feel like it's going to be a dark story. It really feels as though it's going to be a lighthearted, um, feel-good story. So as you're reading, you realize that they are all gathering for a purpose, and no one seems to really take it too seriously. It um, just seems like something they always do. It's a tradition. It's just a way of life, and they, they gather um, together, I guess, down in the in the downtown area of their picturesque town, <laughs> and um, no one seems to mind until they start actually conducting the lottery. Okay, you remember now? I definitely remember the premise of the story. You remember 100%. better than me, and you read it in eighth grade, and I read it like. Well, it was ago. so impactful <laughs> to me. That was kind of the first time, you know. And without giving too much away, I think we can liken it somewhat to the Hunger Games yes. in a way. Yeah. And in my little eighth grade mind, I had not really been exposed to any sort of story like that. That was the OG yeah, creepy it was. story. It's exactly what I thought when I was reading it, too. And really what stuck out to me was the fact that they were numb to what was going on. You know, there was a numbness. There wasn't, um, kind of like in the Hunger Games, uh, once you see something so many times or once something becomes tradition, Uh, No one realizes it may be wrong or it may be hurtful to someone. It's just something they do. And you become numb to it and it just becomes just another tradition or another um, event that happens. Desensitization. 
Exactly. Yeah. And maybe, too, like when the, with the younger kids, not that I'm likening this to society today in any way whatsoever, <laughs> but younger Never. kids, yeah, they don't know a, any other way. Right. And whatever they see every day or whatever they experience every day just becomes normal behavior. Mm-hmm. And this was normal behavior to everyone there except for the one person that it affected. Yeah. Even to the family. You know, mm, yeah. And they were like, oh, well. Huh. But once it happens to you and you realize the hurt or the fear that's involved, mm. then all of a sudden it becomes real. You know? Do you think maybe that was one of the major points of the story? I think so. I think it, it's it, super deep. It definitely made me think maybe there are things happening in our society now that um, that don't affect me but affect other people and I don't realize it. And maybe um, I'm desensitized to it. Yeah. Because it doesn't affect me. That so I think, it, I think it's definitely something that everyone should read. I mean, most eighth graders do. Not this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I think you're right. I think it's a good story. Um, um, I'm still confused on why they call it the lottery, The Adventures of James Harris. Because James was only in a few stories. That's interesting. Yes. Did you Google it? No, but I will. Yeah, I Google everything. In fact, every time we pick an author, mm-hmm. I do a Google deep dive. Yeah. And I kind of learn, I read a lot about the person. And so, um, actually, there is a movie on Netflix that is a fictional biographical account of Shirley Jackson's life. Really? I think it's called Shirley. Hmm. Don't. Shirley is called Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but what was interesting about this fictionalized biographical account of her life was that there were a lot of true parts. And I read an article about the producer who said, we wanted to make a story with Shirley-esque qualities to it Mm. so that the viewer was kind of inside of a Shirley Jackson-type novel, but also it was about Shirley. So it was kind of confusing to me because I was like, wait, what's real and what's not? So, of course, I Googled it, and I read all about her life. And there are pieces in there that you would think aren't true that are true. Really? Yeah. So some of the really most interesting points. Number one, she was a like a self-professed witch. Oh. Did you know that? No. Well, does she have a story somewhere that's about, and maybe it's in this one, in the lottery, about witches? Mm. But, uh, so I just Googled this to see about why, why it's called mm. The Adventures of James Harris, and he is woven throughout a lot of these stories, and you just don't realize it. Oh. It's saying that, you know, in The Damon Lover... Where the woman, it's her wedding day, and she's waiting for her fiancé to come home because they're going to be wed. He never shows up. She goes Mm -hmm. to look for him, and she looks all over town for him. And everyone says they had seen him. They'd seen him picking up flowers, and they had seen him shining his shoes. And um, she goes back home to wait for him, and he never comes. She ends up, I may be getting the story a little confused about the uh, timeline, but (laughs) she ends up. Someone mentioned that he had gone into a certain apartment. So she goes to the apartment. She hears talking and laughing, Mm -hmm. and she bangs on the door, and no one comes. She goes back day after day, and no one ever answers the door. And so it's saying here that he was never mentioned. His name was never mentioned, but he was James Harris. Oh. He may be in all these stories. You just don't know which one Yeah, that's kind of creepy. And you know what that reminds me of? What? Do you remember Fight Club? Never saw it. Okay, well, it's a book by Chuck Palahniuk, who's creepy. He's creepy, too. And the movie, um, I don't want to, like, bust anybody's bubble, but this movie is so old. If you haven't watched it yet, Brad Pitt, right? I mean, okay, so, like, throughout the whole movie, there are these tiny little flashes of a guy in all these scenes. So he, like, shows up real quick and then disappears. Ed Norton. Yeah. Ding, ding, ding. So maybe I did see part of it. Yeah, you might have. So, like, two creepy writers interweaving one dude throughout the whole thing. Yes. Oh. So now I kind of want to go back and kind of want to go back <laughs> and read a few more of these. Because, you know, the first story, you may not remember this, but the first short story was about a man who was taking a break from a party. Hmm. And he goes into the kitchen of this house and a young woman comes down. She's, I think, 17 in the story. She comes down, and she pours some coffee, and she sits and talks with him. And it seems as though he's intrigued by her. He's mm-hmm. an older man. Um, it seemed a little bit creepy. Um, but that was also, I believe, James Harris. Mm-hmm. Sounds like he's a ladies' man. Maybe he wants to be a ladies' man. <laughs> Maybe so. That has a lovely vibe to but it. But he should not stand up his fiance. That was wrong. But, I mean, the title of the story kind of piqued my interest. Mm-hmm. In conjunction with what you said, with him disappearing into this room, talking to somebody. Like, what happened? I need to know what happened. And you know what? Maybe he is the husband 
in the lottery. Oh. And maybe that's his punishment. Was his wife? <laughs> Mind blown. <laughs> so we actually also have Shirley Jackson's biography at the library. And there are two biographies on Shirley Jackson. I forgot to mention the two most interesting things about the fictional biographical account. There are mm-hmm. two things that stuck out to me that I looked up. One, that I said she was a self-professed witch. Yes. And the second is that um, her husband used to have these wild affairs, and he would come home and make her listen to them. And she wasn't oh, on board. She didn't like it. Right. But they also had four children together. Mm. And so uh, I read this article in The New Yorker that kind of interwove all of these ideas together, which is how I found out that there were two biographies. And the original biographer said that, oh, yes, she's a witch, blah, blah, blah. It was written in the 80s. And so I think Shirley's works came out in like the 50s-ish. And in the 80s, this biographer was saying, oh, she was a witch. She did all this. And this new biography came out in 2016. And Mm -hmm. this biographer was like, it was more of a shtick because she was a a goth lady and was kind of a a dark lady. So she used it. And her writings are on the dark side. Exactly. Most of them are. Yeah. Yeah. So... Whether she was or wasn't, it definitely got played up by maybe right. even the publishing company. Mm-hmm. And another thing that it talked about is kind of the idea of these women figures and all of these different stories. Yes. And how they almost have these two different sides where they might be the typical housewife mm-hmm. doing housewife duties or that type of life, but then either something happens to them or there's this other side of them or another female character that has that dark side. Right. A dark side or a deeper side. In the in the lottery, really a martyr uh-huh. in a way. Yeah. I mean, actually, they talked about that yeah. very specifically because I think the biographer felt that Shirley felt like a martyr. Right. I mean, honestly, this is probably in a very different way and not a very obvious way but female empowerment in a way oh yeah Yeah. in the new yorker they called her a proto-feminist and i was like i have no idea what that means so i googled it and it's actually the original feminism before feminism was feminism really before it was really labeled feminism exactly wow yeah so you are so spot on with all of your analysis i read half the book and look at me (laughs) half the book is better than none of the book i decided many years ago that if i am halfway through Mm -hmm. and i'm not feeling it I move on because life is Don't precious. Waste your time. Yeah. Well, when I write one, I'll give it to you and see if you finish it. Ooh, I feel like there's a lot of pressure surrounding <laughs> that. <laughs> All right. You have never had a dirty Shirley. No, I haven't. I really don't even think I've had a Shirley Temple before. Okay. So a Shirley Temple is Sprite with grenadine. Yes. All right. So we have a dirty Shirley, which has your spirits and your Sprite and your grenadine. However, as I'm watching my sugar intake, we used La Croix. Instead of Sprite. La Croix. La Croix. Actually, I think it was an off-brand La Croix. Oh, you're right. Don't let her fool you. What do you think? It's very good. Yes. I enjoy. So. Moving on. So, I also have a theory that this James Harris, who's going through this book, you know, he's he's chatting up this younger woman. He's standing up his fiance. He's doing kind of some of these, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um... He's kind of um, gone rogue. He's doing these things that I guess in this time, it was kind of scandalous uh, for its day. So I'm wondering if she had that experience with her husband. I wonder if this was kind of a therapeutic way to, maybe he was based off of someone, a character like her husband. So to expound on her husband a little bit. He was a professor at a college, but, um, and this is not conjecture. This is everything I've read. I I did a very deep dive. I'm going to say it one more time. And he was a professor at a college, but they both were writers. Mm -hmm. And his work wasn't very prolific. And he didn't ever really reach any sort of, I think he published a couple things, but they were more work-related and they didn't really come to a a notoriety. And I think there was a little bit of jealousy there. Mm -hmm. And so eventually she was the breadwinner. She raised their four children. She did all the housework and had to listen about his affairs. Yes. And she was a successful one in a business that he wanted to be in. Exactly. Wow. So there was some animosity. And, And it even says in a lot of the articles, they didn't even really like each other. And by the end of their marriage and maybe their lives, I think they were always married. Again, um, fact check. Yeah, <laughs> we don't have the money for a fact checker in here. We are hiring if anyone wants to be our fact checker. <laughs> um, but they were like they bit at each other and mm. they like said nasty things to each other. It was just it was really toxic, yeah. unhealthy, horrible kind of life. Yeah. So 
You, again, are spot on. Yes, here mm-hmm. I go again. Here I go again on my own. Pew, 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 pew. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and I had a thought. Well, you know what that reminds me of, Jen? What? Have you ever watched The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel? No, I think you might have mentioned oh, it to me before. I'm sure I have. Her husband wants to be a comedian. He's a terrible comedian. Mm. She has a few drinks after she finds out that her husband has been um, cheating on her, gets up in front of a crowd to tell her story, and she's flipping hilarious. Oh, how cool. And then she becomes a, a famous comedian. What a, And what an excellent revenge. Mm. Yes. So it's kind of like Shirley. Yeah. But she really got the, the last word in the fact that she became oh. the famous writer. And her interpretation of her husband and all these characters mm-hmm. is living on. Right. Almost like she's exposed him. It's like her yeah. last, you know. Forever. Yeah. A, a retelling over and over yeah. of what a bad can, Let me tell you about <laughs> yeah. you. Yeah, exactly. Anyway. So we have always lived in the castle. Have is you read that one? I got halfway through. And, I mean, it was interesting, mm-hmm. but it's very... Uh, psychological oh really and and i watched the movie too and the movie movie of we have always lived in the castle it's on netflix and i didn't realize it was a shirley jackson story until going through this exercise but you know when you watch something that's so like i call it like super deep you know and you watch it and you're like i think i know what's going on but also i'm not like a hundred percent and that was kind of the whole movie and the same vibe lives in the book so what's what's the setup there are two uh, girls, they're sisters, and they live in this castle, basically. Mm-hmm. It's a, a family home, very big. Um, they were the family of the town. And again, it's really kind of this picturesque little town, but what's kind of rotten about it is the the people who live there are very, um, they kind of have turned on this, the idea of this family. Oh. And they're like, oh, well, you know, if they have the money, they have the land, kind of this, we're anti the rich people right. sort of vibe. But the, the parents are gone. And it's just the two daughters mm-hmm. and their uncle who is not doing well. He's yeah. old, a little senile, unhealthy. And so basically, you know, even the book cover, you can kind of see the townspeople are the scary part. Right. And I'm not, I don't want to get. Oh, I bet there's a twist. There's got to be a twist. Yeah, there's definitely a twist. You're on Shirley. I know what the twist is because I watched it. And actually, knowing what it is, and then also reading the book, I can see little pieces coming up, like the foreshadowing Mm -hmm. component, where you're like, "Oh, I know what that means (laughs) because I know how this ends." (laughs) Yeah. So, would you recommend the movie? Yeah, I really would. And if, especially if you're in the mood for a very cerebral type mm-hmm. of movie where you're in your mind a little bit and you have to really pay attention. It's kind of like an M. Night Shyamalan. Yeah, a little mm-hmm. bit. You know, I guess we've got this whole vibe going yeah. on, right? Yeah. A little creepy. Mm-hmm. A little Dirty Shirley. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. To Dirty Shirley. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, What else did she write? Mm. The Haunting of Hill House. That's what it was. Um, I actually got about a third of the way through, and I don't know why it turned me off. I don't know. I guess you, there was like this rash of the same style movie about the scary house, and we just right. kind of were exposed to that genre a lot. So it kind of lost you from the beginning. Yeah. But I mean, if she wrote it in the 50s, maybe again, she was one of the first ones to do that style of story. Right. It says she was born in 1916. Wow. I feel like this is something else I heard recently, but basically her mother was a beautiful woman who was a member of the country club and wanted things a certain way, and Shirley Jackson was not as beautiful as her mother thought she should be and and told her. And actually, Shirley battled with weight. And one article I read said that Shirley, they feel like she just went above and beyond to kind of embrace her weight and maybe... Mm -hmm. Maybe be a little more unhealthy on purpose to spite her mother. Yeah. You know, it's funny you say that because one of the short stories is called Like Mother Used to Make. And it's about a a man who lives in an apartment and he has um, a neighbor who's a female. And obviously they have a friendship. And it doesn't really say if it's anything but platonic. They obviously eat dinner together often and he takes care of her apartment for her. And he mentions, in the short story, he mentions about how dirty her apartment is. So he'll go over there and he'll he'll get her mail for her and he'll put it on the table. And he he looks around and he's 
off put by the fact that her apartment is so dirty. Well, she comes over for dinner and they're eating dinner and he makes a pie and they're eating the pie. And then um, a man shows up and she says, come on in, Mr. Harris. Oh my gosh. And so he comes in and she's, she's introducing Mr. Harris to her friend, David, whose apartment they're in. And she's, she says, this is my coworker, Mr. Harris. And, um, she invites him to sit down and eat dinner. And of course the person telling the story, David is like, why are we inviting him to sit down with us? You know? So he, he obliges and he says, okay, sure. Sit down and enjoy. And then the female in the story is invites Mr. Harris to come sit in the living room. And he then realizes that she's trying to portray that this is her apartment and not his. And so finally, the owner of the apartment says, well, I I think it's time to end the night. And she says, okay, well, you can go on home. And instead of saying, this is my apartment, you may go home. He leaves and goes to her apartment and shuts the door. So it's interesting because she's trying to portray a life that's not true and put on a facade for someone so it's interesting you say that because Shirley kind of probably had some of that in her background of oh, yeah. trying to live a life that um, it looks beautiful from the outside, maybe, it's, and then maybe it's not so beautiful on the inside. Man, I feel like you were the winner with these short stories. I mean, it's really, I'm so interested in that book mm-hmm. because I've never heard of an author using that kind of literary device of putting mm-hmm. one character weaving him throughout a series of short stories. But like, yes, yes, that's but, really neat. But I will say this too. I didn't feel as though her short stories were very fascinating until you told me about her life. So Mm. now it's really becoming more interesting um, knowing that some of this may be a portrayal of something she went through, but in a different setting or in a a different story. So that's interesting. It is. And maybe that's why you should research your author. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. You might get more out of it. Um, you know, I know you know the Alabama Shakes. I know you know. I just moved here, and everybody here knows Brittany Howard because oh, yeah. she went to school around here, mm-hmm. the Alabama Shakes. So before I moved up here, I loved the Alabama Shakes already, mm-hmm. and I got to go to a concert to see them in Birmingham, and I, there was a, I Don't Want to Fight No More, Fight mm-hmm. No More, and I, I thought it was wonderful, but then I went to the concert, and when I saw her sing yeah. it, and I got to experience it, that was the first time I recognized it was actually incredibly sad. Yeah. yeah. Just to hear her. Yeah. yeah. Like, I don't have the energy to fight yeah. anymore, and I don't want to. Wow. So, it's funny that, you know, you can read something and take something away from it. There's really, you have the freedom to give your own version mm-hmm. to it. But when it's coming from the creator, there mm-hmm. it's coming from the way that they intended it. Right. Mm-hmm. And knowing the meaning behind it and the purpose behind it sometimes can give it a whole new spin. Yeah. Man, we're getting so deep. I know. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here's a little snippet of this. You know, I think we already touched on it, but Jackson's fiction is sort of serial investigation of the malevolent imprisoning power of her own fears. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a quote from the New Yorker article. Yeah, there's another story in here that stuck out to me about a girl who lives in an apartment. She's a young girl. And for some reason, none of the doors have locks. And a lady, an older lady, lives below her. And she starts to find that she has some things that are missing in her drawer. Some Mm -hmm. handkerchiefs are missing and some little knickknacks and things. And she's pretty sure it's the lady downstairs that has that has taken her thing. So she goes down and she confronts her. And the, and the, the lady downstairs says, you know, oh, it must be the landlady. I told her that things are becoming missing and she won't listen. So I think she decides then to pretend like she's leaving for the day and spy on her downstairs neighbor to mm-hmm. see if she's going upstairs and taking her things. And she sees the lady goes inside and takes her things and... um she comes back up the stairs and walks in the door. And instead of confronting her, she lets the lady take the things and walk out the door um, and kind of act as though, oh, I'm not taking your things. I'm just looking through your through your drawer, just checking on things. <laughs> right. That's and annoying. it's very passive and non-confrontational. And it just shows that even when she caught her ran handed, she couldn't stand to confront oh, wow. what was actually happening, you know? Same exact theme as the person pretending it's their apartment. In the, yeah, 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 it's a non-confrontational. So well, and that's definitely a testament to how she felt with her husband, right. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. She took it, she let it go on, and um, I mean, obviously to save her family and to keep them intact, but yeah, 
So I don't know if you call that a sacrifice or, but... I don't know, yeah. you know. And I, I think everybody's life is totally different. Yeah. What you will live with mm-hmm. is completely different. Mm-hmm. And the reasons that they have for doing those things are all completely different. It's very true. Yeah. I uh, forgot that it was also in the in the biography that I watched on Netflix. Mm-hmm. She actually had a bout of agoraphobia. She was an agoraphobic as well. And that is... <laughs> Oh, you don't know. Okay. I thought you were going to be like, and there was another short story. <laughs> I was waiting on that. There might be if you told me what to go. <laughs> <laughs> They're afraid to go outside. An agoraphobic is afraid of open spaces. So they, like, mostly they're a shut-in. Oh. I and think Shirley was an agoraphobic. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, everybody's problems present themselves in different ways, right? right? So if, in my opinion, if you're... If you're putting a lid on all the things you want to say and you're passive and you're not standing up to this this brute of a husband, yeah. you know, like maybe her anxiety and her aggression came out in the form of agoraphobia. Right. Isn't okay. it kind of funny, though? Like maybe it was just that time period that she was definitely able to live on her own and raise her kids That's without him. I mean, obviously she was raised to believe that she had to portray a certain image. In, in that day and time, it wasn't um, normalized yeah. for women to divorce. Yeah. And, and really, her writing was, you know, probably her therapy, because therapy probably wasn't a thing at that point. So, she died in her sleep of heart failure at the age of 48. No. Yeah. Very young. How old was she when she wrote most of her work? Well, if she was born, I said in 16, 1916, Mm -hmm. and her work kind of came out uh, 51, 54. So right before she died, really. I I don't think she had much time between being a published author and dying. She was born when? 1916. Plus 48 years, 1964? 1964. And I think Mm -hmm. it said something in here. Yeah, so We Have Always Lived in a Castle was published in 1962. Wow. So I wonder if it was her last one. It's kind of sad that her most famous work, well, one of The Haunting of Hill House is often mentioned as one of the best ghost stories of all time, but it, this article in The New Yorker says that her masterpiece, the beautifully weird novel We Have Always Lived in a Castle, published in 1962, is one of the most substantial pieces of her work. Wow. So it's actually kind of sad to think that she died in 64, and she was really just kind of getting to the pinnacle mm-hmm. of her abilities. Right. What would have she come up with if she hadn't? And so, yeah, the lottery she first was published in, in a magazine in 1948. Like, she already had to be suffering greatly by that time. Yeah. Or maybe she was just born weird. But she had to have somebody to base all these crazy stories True. off of. Well, her mother. Her mother. I think it said her mother's name was Gertrude, and they called her Terrible Gertrude or something. Oh, yeah. that's sad. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Old Gertie. Dirty Gertie. Dirty Gertie. It's a dirty Gertie. (laughs) Clink. (laughs) Dang. Okay, well, I think we've analyzed a lot of her works. Uh, I did not read the biography. I would actually be somewhat interested in that. But from the time we decided to start to do this. Disserted. Disserted. I guess my dirty Shirley's getting to me a little bit. (laughs) It's kicking in. (sighs) From the time we decided to focus on Miss Shirley. Mm Mm-hmm. To now, I think we did some really good reading. We did a wide variety of sampling her works, yeah, digging into her life history, understanding her a little bit as mm-hmm. much as we could, and sharing a sampling of this information with our listeners. So we'll kind of wrap up Shirley with uh, a little bit more info out of this article. In recent years, there have been signs of renewed interest in Jackson's work. Various writers, including Neil Gaiman, Jonathan Latham, and A.M. Holmes, have praised her idiosyncratic talent, and new editions of her work have appeared. And I feel like that they like made a um an award after her name or something, Shirley Jackson Award. Hey Siri. Oh. Yeah, so there's an annual conference every year uh, about the Shirley Jackson Awards, and there are they are literary awards named after Shirley Jackson in recognition of her legacy in writing. So, I mean, the whole idea of a lot of that article I read is that she wasn't, like, terribly famous. She was famous, but she wasn't huge in her day. And over the years, she has grown in fame, mm-hmm. and these other authors, like Neil Gaiman's pretty famous. Yeah. He wrote... 
Ocean at the End of the Lane, I think the Sandman kind of mystical reality. And they've kind of corralled around her to bring her work more to light. Yeah. In honor of her. She kind and, of ushered in a new genre, almost, yeah. if you will. Yeah. Like well, like we said in the beginning, the lottery was kind of the OG Hunger Games. Right. Which I was very impressed People with. People were so shocked by the Hunger Games when the lottery has been around. I mean, for I'm going to have to read it again. You will. You can read it really quickly if you don't read the entire book. <laughs> All short stories in one sitting. Skip ahead to page 423. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you guys for listening to Between the Stacks After Hours. Yes. See you next time. We'll be back again with another episode soon. You've been listening to Between the Stacks After Hours, a podcast brought to you by the Athens Limestone County Public Library. Join us next time for another conversation and a close up look of a featured author and their work. To hear other recordings from our Library Voices podcast series, please visit the Athens Limestone County Library website at alcpl.org. Library Voices is also now available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts.